Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time to gather together. Uh, I thank you for each and every person who is here and those who are making their way here. I uh, just pray that you would give them a safe trip, and I pray that you would be with us this morning as we study your word. Help us to be conformed to what we find there. Uh, and I just pray that our hearts would be softened to the truth of your word and that we would, uh, in turn, be lights for you in this world. We thank you for the church. Thank you for this church specifically. And uh, we know from your word that the church is your chosen instrument to uh, express yourself in this world. And I just pray that we would be faithful to it from your word and that it would be our uh, guiding principle and our only source for the truth. I thank you that we are not uh, <clears throat> confined to the traditions of men, but instead we are uh, confined by the truth of your word. And I just pray that it would guide us in all that we do. And uh, pray specifically for Brenda this morning that you would uh, help this kidney stone to pass and quickly. And we just thank you for Bill and Brenda and their dedication to you. And uh, just uh, pray especially that you would help Brenda to not be in too much pain this morning. And uh, just pray for your hand on her and pray for your will to be done in that situation. And now, Lord, I just ask that you would be with this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Continue and uh, conclude, actually, our look at this incredible chapter of the Bible this morning. Proverbs, uh, a wonderful, practical book that is easily read through uh, in a month's time. Uh, you can read one proverb a day and be through the entire book. And as you do that, uh, and the months pile up, the things will become more and more familiar, and you'll be able to remember them and apply them to the situations uh, of life. And then you will be able to, if you consistently do that in the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to act like a Christian and think like a Christian. That's uh, primarily what this, what this book is about, is a book to show us the importance of our thinking and how our thinking eventually leads to our actions. That's just the way that uh, God has created us to be. Uh, what we think about eventually ends up leading to how we act. And so uh, Solomon, in his method of delivery of the Proverbs, is... is writing this. It's a book of poetry, if you'll remember, and he's writing it as if he's writing to his sons. He's trying to get a hold of the minds of his children so that they will grow in maturity and grow in, in godliness. That's the entire goal of the book of Proverbs. And so Proverbs chapter 3, probably the most practical section of the most practical book of the Bible. We've had these kind of 10 lessons about how to find contentment in the Christian life, how to, how, to, how to live for the Lord. And this week, it is this idea of eschewing evil, to avoid evil, avoid considering evil, thinking about it, and don't be envious of it uh, and the results of it primarily. Uh, but our 10 keys for commit contentment are to internalize God's word, like reading the Proverbs every month. That's a, a good place to start uh, at any rate. We need to trust in the Lord, trust, put, have our faith in the Lord, believe in the Lord. Uh, those are all, all mean the same thing. Without faith, it is sort of hard to please the Lord. Uh, no, of course, it is impossible to please the Lord. God, God is not a respecter of persons. He's not, uh, he's not interested in our uh, human efforts to further 
his cause in this world. What, and that's kind of the, the underlying problem with things like the church growth movement and uh, as we were mentioning in the articles, uh, Saddleback Church, that like their entire drive has been, from the beginning, has been using uh, church growth principles, which are essentially business principles, in order to grow the church. And that is, that is misguided, to say the least. We don't see anything remotely close to that in the scriptures uh, as far as oh, in the book of Acts and the life of Paul. We don't see him trying to use various business techniques to get people to come to his school of prophets and these kinds of things. He taught the word. And, uh, and Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he preached the word to people and thousands of people got saved. Uh, And so we need to be walking by faith, trusting in his word, having it be a part of ourselves, have no confidence in yourself. That goes hand in hand with trusting in the Lord. We need to be generous with our money. Uh, Money is, is the root of all kinds of evil, the Bible says. It's not the root of all evil, as it's often misquoted, but it it's certainly something that can uh, take over our thinking and our, our motivation for life can be geared towards money rather than towards God's Word, and that's a problem, of course. Uh, we need to grow in the struggle. We need to be willing to take discipline from the Lord, apply it to our lives, and uh, grow in it. Grow in the midst of difficulties in our lives and not become... Uh, bitter. Seek wisdom and knowledge. Uh, We need to know that the Lord is with us. Be generous, not just with our money, but also with our with our time and our in our gifts, our abilities and these kinds of things. Last time we saw the importance of loving your neighbor. Uh, Probably not even probably. It is one of the greatest commandments. We love God and we love our neighbor. That's then this is the fulfillment of the scriptures according to Jesus' own words. And then today we get to askew evil, and I finally fixed the underline. <laughs> Proverbs three thirty one says, Do not envy a man of violence, and do not choose any of his ways. But he uh, for the devious are an abomination to the Lord, but he is intimate with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to the afflicted. The wise will inherit honor, but fools display dishonor. So here we, we see uh, this contrast technique that Solomon is using here uh, throughout this Section. It's not always, not always exactly the same formula, but he is contrasting uh, the actions of the evil with the actions of the wise and how God's reaction to evil people and God's reaction to people who are acting wisely, contrasting that to bring out the, uh, the difference between the two. So we are not to... Envy a man of violence, according to Proverbs 3.31. Do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. So this term envy, it's very closely related to uh, covetousness, same kind of uh, idea, but a little bit, a little nuanced, if you will. Uh, Envy kind of goes along the lines of longing for something that isn't yours. And, and in this case, it's, uh, it's more geared towards the traits that a person may have or, or the benefits or outcomes of, of what someone else may have or the results of what someone else is doing is kind of is envy, whereas covetousness is normally applied to someone's uh, wealth, the things that they have, their stuff. Envy more geared towards, uh, could be somebody's looks, somebody's uh, uh, intelligence, some, you know, somebody's gifts and abilities, these kinds of things. 
That's what envy uh, is more geared towards. Somebody's uh, fame, for example. There's something that a lot of uh, churches are envious of it, that gets us into trouble, that, <laughs> that we need to be very careful of, particularly in this day and age where it seems like uh, everybody could be a, a star on YouTube and social media and these kinds of things. And, and so we get our focus to getting a million followers on YouTube rather than staying true to God's Word. We could be envious of some other church or some other pastor who has reached this level of fame, if you will. And we ought not to do that. Uh, not that those people are men of violence, but we ought not to do it in that regard either. Interesting uh, man of violence, I don't know if you are familiar with this, but the term, the Hebrew term for violence is Hamas. And the uh, Arabic term for violence is Hamas. That's what the, that group is. They are literally uh, named for violence. You are, you are uh, as we've been studying in Revelation, how king and kingdom are intimately tied together. You can describe one. You're kind of known by what you do. That's uh, this terrorist organization, Hamas. They are uh, known for violence and wrongdoing, specifically. And we are not uh, to be envious of these kinds of, of people and the results that come from those activities. Uh, in this case, the man of violence, it's describing somebody who's like uh, gangsters or this kinds of thing. Uh, Al Capone back in the, the early 20th century was a man of violence, well-known man of violence, had wealth, power, fame, all of these things, and people could have easily been very envious of the outcomes that appeared to be very good for him. And we cannot, be, we cannot be doing this kind of thing. Instead, we need to be focused on the long term. We're going to, to find out that in the end, that the man of violence is, is going to come to a very different conclusion than uh, what he may currently be enjoying. It always comes to ruin. And so we need to keep our focus on the long term, like Paul said to Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly <laughs> desires. So we are to be uh, denying worldly desires. The man of violence is completely about worldly desires and the flesh. Instead, we are to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So we need to ensure that we are uh, not envying these people. Instead, as Paul says in other places, realize that these kinds of actions are what are bringing God's wrath to the earth. So why would we participate in it? It doesn't mean that if, this does not mean that if we find ourselves envying these people that, oh, suddenly we're not saved anymore. Uh, Christians don't, real Christians don't do these kinds of things. That's not at all what is being stated. Rather, the Motivation for the Christian life is the fact that Christ can come again for us at any moment, and therefore we ought not to be living like the unsaved because his wrath is coming because of what they are doing. So as a blood-bought believer, why in the world would you act like that? That's uh, the message. We are not to choose his ways, according to verse 31, do not choose any of his <laughs> ways. I like that word, choose. It is a reminder to us that we are created beings 
with the ability to think. God doesn't just desire for us to think. He demands that we use our brains, that we think, and that we make proper choices. That's what the entire book of Proverbs is about, making wise choices in life. And if it weren't up to us to make decisions, he wouldn't tell us over and over and over to not choose ways of evil, choose ways of good. Oh, by the way, believe. The, the, the very term believe has within it the option of a choice. It goes without saying. Uh, it's inherent in, the, in the, the, the words itself. If God is desiring for us to believe in him, to trust in him, to have our faith in him, and calling us to do that, that means that we have a choice and that we have to make the correct choice. Uh, in terms of our justification in order to receive the forgiveness of life, and also in our sanctification, our daily walk with Him. He desires for us to not choose the ways of evil, but instead choose the ways of good. And in this case, uh, that also makes very obvious that sanctification is cooperative. God doesn't just uh, pour out His Holy Spirit on us, and then we're just robotically uh, going to the revival service, for example. Or we're just robotically helping old ladies across the street. We're robotically uh, giving money to church or using our spiritual gifts, these kinds of things. No, it is, a, it is a choice. There is cooperation. Yes, the Holy Spirit is very much involved in the life of a believer uh, as he is convicting of convicting us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and revealing the truth of his word to us. And then we make a choice to submit to his conviction, to live according to his word, and these kinds of things as the Holy Spirit is directing us. And so, in this case, the ways of the ungodly are uh, his ungodly ways of gain, of course. And there are many, many uh, other examples of this in Scripture. Uh, Proverbs sixteen twenty nine: a man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. Proverbs 1, 10, we've already seen this. My son, if sinners enti entice you, do not consent. It says, uh, Solomon says there. That's a choice. You can either you have the choice to either consent to sin as it's presented to you or to not consent to it. Solomon's charge, God's charge to us is to not consent. Proverbs 12:26, the righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Proverbs 37, beginning in verse 1, says, "Do not fret because of evil doers." Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. A message to Israel, of course. Delight yourself in the Lord and he, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. So we need to be focused on the truth of God's word, godliness and these kinds of things rather than on ungodly gain. And uh, really, uh, Ephesians 5, 1 through 21, of course, we don't have time to, to go through all of that, but the first few verses... Uh, Ephesians 5, 1, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. 
uh, verse 6 of Proverbs, uh, Ephesians 5. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So the, the man of violence is bringing God's wrath to this earth. Why participate in that? Ephesians 5.15, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, Paul says. It almost seems like he was studying Proverbs as he was uh, writing this section of Ephesians with an emphasis on wisdom. We need to be careful how we walk. Not as unwise. The man of violence is very unwise. If you'll remember our... uh, description of wisdom as having knowledge and and walking in it. This guy is not doing that at all. His uh, source of knowledge is his own flesh and trying to satisfy his flesh through ungodly ways of gain. And therefore, uh, he is not walking wisely as wisdom and knowledge uh, comes from the Lord. And there's our uh, Christian life slide that we don't have time to go through. So we'll save that for another time. (laughs) Notice the characteristics of the man of violence that are described here. Uh, Verse 32, for the devious are an abomination to the Lord. So he is devious. He He is duplicitous in his actions. Says one thing, does another. Uh says different things to different people, trying to manipulate situations for himself. Uh, The devious are an abomination to the Lord, but he is intimate with the upright. Uh, He's also wicked. Verse 33, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked. The wickedness is anti-Godism, if you will living contrary to uh, God and his word. This man of violence is also a scoffer. Uh, And it says in verse 34 that God scoffs at the scoffers. Though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to the afflicted. He's also foolish, and he displays dishonor according to verse 35. Notice the consequences of these Action. So he's devious, he's wicked, he's a scoffer, he's foolish. There are consequences for these actions because after all, God, the creator of the physical universe and all of the laws that govern it, I don't know if you've, I guess it's been kind of cloudy here the last few weeks, but I've been flying at night uh, this month and so have had an incredible view of Jupiter and Venus as they are traveling uh, kind of, Last week in particular, they were right next to the moon. I've never seen it. Never seen planets and moon in alignment like that. It was just, it's fantastic. And that is testimony to God and his creation. Uh, And it is the same, in the same way that God created the physical laws of the universe that we can predict where planets will be precisely uh, that are millions, tens and tens of millions of miles away from us moving at incredible speeds, and we know exactly where they will be and what time they will be there. Uh, Because God created the universe in that way, the spiritual realm is exactly the same. It is precisely the same. There are laws that govern the spiritual world, and they're revealed to us in his word. And the number one law that is in the scriptures is that we can't make ourselves right with God through our works. He does not respect that. He respects faith and trust in him and the completed work of Jesus Christ in order to receive the forgiveness of your sins. That's a spiritual law that cannot be broken, that can be perfectly uh, predicted, the outcomes, if we choose not to trust in him. The outcome is given to us in the scriptures, and it's eternal separation from God. If we do put our faith or our trust in Christ and his work on the cross for us, the result is completely predictable. We know the answer with 100% certainty that we will receive 
eternal life because God, who cannot lie, says so in his word. And so we can be completely assured of that. And so there are uh, consequences for wrong actions. And one of the consequences for this man of violence is since he is devious, he is an abomination to the Lord. That ought to, that ought to shake us a little bit. Let's not be devious uh, with one another because that is an abomination to the Lord. We cannot do that. Just the same uh, way that the man of violence cannot do that. He's also cursed. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked. Uh, kind of like God, uh, one of the spiritual laws that God has created is that those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. Fact from the scriptures, and we see it play out over and over and over and over again throughout history. Uh, this is the same way. Your ho- uh, you live in a house that is wicked. Your house is known by the actions of the people who live within it. It's cursed. Good things aren't going to happen eventually. If we scoff at the Lord, people who scoff at the Lord, he scoffs at them. And that, uh, that ought to be a little bit uh, eye-opening as well. Uh, you hear the scoffers all the time. Uh, we watched a video the other day about Christopher Hitchens. I would classify him. He's formerly a scoffer. I don't think he's a scoffer anymore. Uh, he kind of scoffed at the Lord at every opportunity that he had. Uh, according to this, the Lord scoffs at those kinds of people. And eventually he's going to show himself to be dishonorable. Uh, the w- verse 35, the wise will inherit honor, but fools display dishonor. There are also some very good uh, consequences of obedience. We have intimacy with God. Verse 32, he is intimate with the upright. Do you want to be intimate with God? Who doesn't want to be intimate with the creator of the universe, at least as a believer? That ought to be our goal. Of course, he is intimate with the upright. He also blesses the dwelling of the righteous. We have blessings from God. They may not be material, uh, but there are blessings from God in obedience to his word. We receive grace from God. Verse 34, he gives grace to the afflicted. He helps us through the difficult patches of life. And there is also, we also have an honorable inheritance that is sealed as believers, that is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, as a believer in Jesus Christ, one of the, there are different numbers of uh, things that happen at the instant we trust in Christ for salvation. One of them is being sealed by the Holy Spirit uh, as a down payment for our future in the kingdom with him. That is uh, sealed by the Holy Spirit. And this is part of that honorable inheritance uh, that we have here. The wise will inherit honor. And of course, there is great blessing and grace in that. And the kingdom will be a time of all of these things. Intimacy with God, he will be living there. Blessing from God, he will be ruling and reigning over this earth. Grace from God will be living in a world that is becoming more and more uh, the way he originally created it to be. And as believers, uh, according to Revelation 5.10, we will rule and reign with him. And therefore, that will be honorable, to say the least. And so there is our 10 keys for contentment and how to live for the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Proverbs. I thank you for these people and their attention to your word. I just pray that you would uh, bless their faithfulness, that you would help us all to walk according to the truths that we find here. And we just pray for your will to be done. Again, we lift up Brenda. Just pray for comfort for her and uh, wisdom in dealing with uh, the health issue that she has. We pray for your will to be done. In Jesus' name, amen.